Each week on At Issue, we sit down with one of the key players of the 2024 legislative session. This week joining us is Senate Minority Leader Derek Simmons of Greenville. Welcome to At Issue. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Mike. Well, it's our, it's our pleasure. All right, so um, I think the the biggest story this session, I think the thing that's gotten the most um, attention from uh, the, the, the outside world looking into the legislature is, is the question of Medicaid expansion. Uh, going into the session, there seemed to be finally an appetite with new leadership in the House, at least, uh, to, to, to pursue. Uh, the House has uh, advanced uh, a bill to expand Medicaid. It has some, you know, some other requirements in it. It's not, it's not a clean expansion of Medicaid, but the House just looks like they're going to be sending something your way. Um, what is the Senate? I mean, as a Senate minority leader, uh, you have a kind of a your, your finger on the pulse of the chamber. Um, now, granted, you are in the minority, but there's 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 still input. There's influence. What's what does the Senate want to see done? Um, at least, at least, especially the Democratic, the Senate Democratic Caucus want to see done when it comes to Medicaid expansion. Well, certainly, we've been pushing for Medicaid expansion for almost a decade or so, just like the House Democrats. Uh, we're talking about two hundred thousand plus working Mississippians without access to health care. Uh, one uh, of six uh, women of childbearing age uninsured. Forty six thousand children in the state of Mississippi uninsured. When you look at an area like the Mississippi Delta, you have one pediatrician for every 4,000 children, and there's not one NICU or neo-intensive neo care unit mm-hmm. in the Mississippi Delta. So uh, our hospitals, 54% of rural hospitals, are at risk of immediate closure, and every single hospital in the state of Mississippi uh, are experiencing some kind of financial distress. So. Um, we know that Medicaid expansion is is the answer to getting uh, or to resolving or at least uh, providing some kind of solution uh, to to the problem that that we know exists in the state of Mississippi regarding health care crisis. On the Senate side, uh, we certainly commend um, Speaker Jason White for his leadership and certainly House Leader uh, uh, Johnson for for working to push Medicaid expansion, and we, the, by a vote of 96 to 20, uh, the measure has passed the House and is being transmitted to the Senate. And the way I look at it, Mike, is that we have to treat Medicaid expansion and have to secure the votes on the Senate side like we did in 2020 when we had to change the state flag mm. uh, because we had a governor who – uh, was opposed to changing the state flag. We had to make sure that we had a veto-proof uh, vote in both chambers. And so I look at Medicaid expansion the exact same way since uh, the governor is being a, a vocal about the fact that he still would uh, veto any measure that comes to his desk as it relates to Medicaid expansion. So we need 36 votes on the okay. Senate side, and I will do everything in my power to work uh, with Democrats and also with my colleagues across the aisle and securing that required number of votes to to override a governor veto. So, so it sounds like you know you know I know I know the Democratic, the Democratic caucus in both in both chambers have have long pushed for just a clean expansion of Medicaid. But it's from from what I'm hearing from you is is that there are some concessions to get that get to that 36 vote threshold if it means that some type of Medicaid expansions in place, whether it requires whether whether there's a worker requirement, you know, put into the bill or other things. To me, it sounds like you know, it, it, ex- there are concessions to be made as long as those 36 votes can you can get to the 36 votes. Well, certainly, Democrats, if we actually were in the majority and if it was a Democratic perfect world, we would like to see a clean Medicaid expansion bill, uh, uh, just expanding according to the Affordable Care Act. But uh, if a work requirement. Uh, is what is being sent to us of course, from the House, and we need to have a work requirement in in the bill, which even the bill that we have pushed, uh, uh, the bill has been for working Mississippians. So they're already working, really. Right. And so uh, we're going to support a Medicaid expansion bill because it's just the right thing to do for the state of Mississippi. Okay. And um, it's going to... Uh, you said it's been it's being transmitted from the House. It'll it'll land with 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 Senator Blackwell, the chair of Medicaid. Um, I mean, have you, what conversations have you had with him about this? I've talked to Chairman Blackwell, and the bill that was sponsored by him was just to bring the code sections forward. Uh, 
I have not had a discussion with him since the House passed its measure and transmitted it to the Senate. Um, but I will have that conversation with him, and I also will have that conversation with Lieutenant Governor Holzman at some point. Okay. Um, in the Senate, there are some Democratic chairs of committee, um, one of which is, is Juan Barnett, uh, the chair of the Corrections Committee, Senate Corrections Committee, um, who um, has filed legislation and it's in this committee, so it, and, and it has been taken up, and there's been some there's been some action on it, no vote yet, but some some at least some hearing and debate on it on a measure to to we'll, we'll kind of scale back parchment. Um, parchment is in your neck of the woods. I mean, you're you're a Delta senator. Um, we've heard a lot about you know the the conditions at parchment. There's a DOJ investigation into parchment, and just recently, um, that as of today, uh, the DOJ has uh, announced investigations at the other. Uh, Mississippi prisons in Wilkinson, Central and, and South, um, faci- the, the Central and South facilities as well. Um, so, I mean, with with Parchman kind of as as the focus, um, what and with with it, with Chair Barnett, you know, um, chairing Senate Corrections, it's, it's a place where the Democratic Party seems to at least have a little bit more, you know, influence. Uh, what would what what is the what's the kind of the the idea? What's the direction uh, when it comes to addressing Parchman and the in the, the state of corrections in Mississippi? Well, certainly, um, I, I don't believe in private prisons. Uh, I think that if we're going to have a, a system of corrections, they should be state-owned and operated facilities, and we should do everything in our power to make sure that we are providing the necessary funds to make sure that that the facilities for those individuals who have made those mistakes and who have to actually spend time there, that they are humane. Uh, we want to make sure that the buildings – are of a certain condition uh, and also that they are properly staffed uh, so that those Mississippians that are working in those conditions are in fact safe. So we wanted to be safe for those Mississippians who work there and also safe for those Mississippians who are serving time there. Uh, With what we've seen with uh, DOJ's investigation and um, the fact that they have looked at parchment, uh, the conditions were not uh, at a point satisfactory to 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 any anyone uh, who have any sense of humanity, right? And so, uh, I think that, that that is a concern. But when you're from the Mississippi Delta, and and you have a measure to to talk that that speaks to closing parchment, uh, you have to do certainly a cost benefit analysis, and you have to represent the people in that in that in that particular area, and so. Uh, a lot of single moms work there, mm. and they are providing for uh, families in the Mississippi Delta. And so, I, I strongly believe when 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 we support uh, women in Mississippi, we are in fact supporting families. And families in the Mississippi Delta, a lot of times, based upon policies that we have seen, and I've been in the Mississippi uh, legislature for 13 years, um, have been looked over and left behind. And I want to make sure that all of the questions are answered as it relates to what will happen to those employees uh, at, at, at Parchman. Uh, Senator Barnett's uh, bill, uh, we, in, in, within it, it, uh, it, it, it expresses the, that the state would, I think, be, would purchase the correctional facility in Tutwiler uh, that is, I think, currently operated by CoreCivic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I think the the bill's kind of kind of gotten to this. Uh, it's been held because there's questions about costs and logistics. Um, you know, Tutwiler's you know still the Delta, uh, and, and it might require a lot of those singles moms to to endure more of a commute. But I mean, being from that area is I mean is that a, is that a feasible solution to you um, as far as like you know at least securing the 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 work for the for the people that rely on parchment for work. Well, well. If if a mother is driving a certain distance to work or any employee is, is driving a certain distance to work, if he or she has to drive a longer distance, then the question is whether or not you are constructively taking their job, right? And so uh, the Delta is a vast area. And so we actually will leave Greenville and drive to Cleveland for a job or leave Cleveland and drive to Inanola for a job. So driving uh, is not uncommon uh, for work in the Mississippi Delta. Um, And so if all the jobs would be at Tutwiler, uh, 
then it may not be as much of a concern as what we have heard in the halls and walls of the Capitol, mm-hmm. uh, which is they will be guaranteed a job at some regional jail or some jail okay. or some facility in the system in the Mississippi Department of Corrections. Well, that is concerning, and I know senators do have and representatives do have questions, certainly the ones from the Delta, about what, how does that look. Mm-hmm. And so if a person has to leave the Delta and go to Marshall County or leave the Delta and go to Wilkinson County or leave the Delta and go to Central Mississippi and Rankin County, uh, then the question is, are you essentially taking their job? And so uh, I just like to look at all the data. Uh, I would, would have loved for the state to have moved first in purchasing uh, the Tutwiler facility so we can know that it is a state facility that that those individuals will be guaranteed a job because it's a state facility as opposed to moving in the direction of closing parchment first without the actual purchase. Because mm-hmm. if you close it and then those individuals have to apply uh, privately to Core Civic for a job, we don't know how that how they really look. And then they would lose their state benefits and, and all of that as well. Certainly. So, um, the conversation about parchment and scaling it back, I mean, how much is that, do you, to, to your knowledge, is it informed by what's happening in Alabama um, with the with the, basically the DOJ and the uh, and then their investigation and now Alabama's faced with a, you know, the construction of a billion-dollar prison? I mean, it's, it's hard, is some of that, is that part of the cost-benefit analysis? Is, you know, they're trying to maybe get in front of any potential DOJ ruling and, and finding uh, that would require something along those lines? Certainly, I, I do think that is a major consideration on why we are seeing some of the measures that we uh, that have been proposed this legislative session. Um, and, you know, uh, anytime the federal government is looking at the state of Mississippi, then certainly we want to respond and do the right thing uh, policy-wise. Um, um, and so I, I do think that's a consideration. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same kind of in the same vein, um, you know, it, it, we're talking about conditions in prison, um, you know, Parchman. Looking at what happens to you know, the incarcerated after they get out, um, a lot of uh, I know that there's been litigation regarding Mississippi's uh, antiquated uh, disenfranchisement clause. It's in, in, it's part of the 1890 Constitution. Um, the 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 motives and and methods I, I think are, are clear as to why those why those that that disenfranchisement clause was written in there, um, but we're seeing some movement. Um, we've seen at least vocally uh, from the Speaker of the House uh, this desire to kind of explore reenfranchisement. How do we give those formerly incarcerated Mississippians who've who've served their 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 penance, who've time, time and or fines, however it might be? But the conversations is at least happening now that uh, the to find a path to get these get these um, residents there. Their, their suffrage back, their, their voting rights back. Uh, so I guess two parts. Um, uh, as the Senate minority leader and as a member of the Senate, um, how do you feel seeing the House be the one that kind of takes this up um, and, and really becomes the vocal, at least the vocal leader in this change? But secondly, you know, as someone um, uh, um, who, who represents a, a caucus and a community uh, that has long been the target of things like this, the, the, the disenfranchisement clause in the Constitution, uh, that at least there might be an appetite for some legislative solution to it. Well, as one of our legislative priorities, and and I have served and had the pleasure and the honor of serving my colleagues as a Senate Minority Leader since 2017, and we've always had election reform as one of our legislative priorities. And in our election reform priority, we have always push for the expansion or the restoration of voting rights. And we uh, have opposed any measure or any policy that will restrict uh, or, or would actually take away or remove a person's right to, to vote. And so because we believe it's sacred and we believe that right to vote is fundamental. And so uh, the fact that it's being pushed or we see movement in the House, uh, we embrace that. Um, to the extent that we have not seen the movement that we wanted to see on the Senate side, uh, we recognize that uh, it's still the Mississippi legislature. And sometimes we get movement on issues uh, that originate in the Senate. Sometimes we get movement on a lot of issues that we care about that would originate in the House. Uh, but 
we still embrace and accept uh, and uh, will certainly support wherever the movement is coming from mm-hmm. because we like to just at the end of the day being the minority party we want good policy in the state of Mississippi to improve the quantity and quality of life of all Mississippians and anytime it's bad policy of course we try to do everything we can to make that policy as as uh, less harmful uh, to, to Mississippians uh, as possible uh, and so yes we would love to see uh, um uh, the right to vote to be restored, um, and we certainly understand the historical context as to why uh, that was placed actually in our constitution. And then, speaking of um, the again, using the constitution as a segue, um, we've we've spoken before uh, how the how important it is for your caucus to to bring back the ballot initiative, um, and we've we've seen some movement in the Senate in, in prior sessions. Um, you, you just kind of talked about like where things originate. Mm-hmm. I believe the last two sessions, the Senate has tried to originate legislation that restored in some ways the ballot initiative. Um, it, it seems like I was getting traction in, in both chambers. Um, but in, in either iteration, it, in, I've had conversations with Minority Leader Johnson. In either iteration, it doesn't it does not seem to be the clean restoration of the process that I think a lot of um, legislative Democrats want. So um, where we, we talked about concessions earlier with Medicaid, I mean, where 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 do you stand, and and what are the concessions you're willing to give when it comes to uh, restoring the ballot initiative? Because the, what we have coming out of the House has restrictions, um, and we haven't seen what the Senate's done yet. Well, my guess, you know, um, after the November 2020 election, where the voters in Mississippi came out in record numbers and passed medical marijuana. Uh, we saw a push in the 2021 regular legislative session to to amend or change what the voters of Mississippi had decided in November uh, of the previous year. And also uh, the Supreme Court considered uh, uh, the, the ballot initiative uh, in the Constitution and declared it unconstitutional. Democrats believe that um, what was next was a ballot initiative for Medicaid expansion. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons we, we believe that the ballot initiative process was declared unconstitutional because the voters, 80 percent of voters believe in Medicaid expansion and want Medicaid expansion. And the Mississippi legislature, until recently, with a 96 to 20 vote in the House, had failed to speak to Medicaid expansion. And when we fail to speak, that ballot initiative process that was in the Constitution allows uh, the citizens of the state of Mississippi to put an issue on the ballot. So we would like to see and we have advocated for and we support just doing simply what the Supreme Court decided in April of 2021, which was the districts. We no longer have five congressional districts. We only have four. Just address, yeah, addressing the proportionment, addressing the proportionment of the actual districts and keep the the process exactly how it was already written in the Constitution and address the issue that they they, they opined upon that was unconstitutional, which was the districts and the mm-hmm. districts alone. Right. And the measures that we have seen since then, 22 and 23 and now in 24, have actually placed a lot of restrictions on it. Have increased the number of signatures that were required or, or uh, the measure that passed the House uh, put language in what issues should not be able to be brought as a ballot initiative. Uh, and so... Um, is that a true ballot initiative then? If, if if it restricts what the voters can vote on to you and to you and members of your caucuses, is 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 that a true ballot initiative? It's not. Okay. It's not. Uh, but if they want to go down that road, of course, Democrats believe that we should never have to talk about the flag again, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, to all your listeners out there and all your viewers out there, you can expect from yours truly an amendment that will basically say that we should never, ever talk about the flag again. Leave it as it is. <laughs> Leave it as it is. Right? Okay. Uh, and so we still need to restore the ballot initiative. And, and to, to your question, I think Democrats will, will certainly consider and look at very closely the language as it relates to uh, the ballot initiative and how, how we restore that, because we think that restoring it is certainly uh, more important than – uh, getting caught up in, in little small details, but we want it to be a workable solution that we put back uh, and we want it to be a, a, attainable. 
We don't want to pass something and uh, Mississippians are unable to have a real uh, say at the ballot box when the legislature fails to speak just because they can't uh, put an issue on the ballot because they can't actually do yeah. what the law we put in place as it relates to ballot initiative. And since it's a constitutional moon, it is going to have to pass both chambers with with two thirds. That's correct. Vote, and we'll have to go to the and we'll have to go to the people. Um, is there, um, you know, th- with that being said, and this is a question I haven't really asked anybody yet. But uh, that being said, I mean, it's, if 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 it's if it passes with a two third majority um, out of out of the Senate and the House, uh, and it goes to the people without with, with restrictions that that your caucus. Uh, fundamentally, fundamentally disagrees with. Um, it has it, 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 in order to take the next step. It does need ratification from the from the people. Well, where will you be vocally when it comes to um, engaging with the public about the ballot initiative? Will we will we see will we see opposition from lawmakers uh, to, to 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 the electorate saying, "Don't do this." You know, this is we think we can do better. I I, I think what you will see after the vote. And between what happens after it, the, you, you're going to see advocacy based upon the vote. Okay. Uh, uh, if we support the ballot initiative, you likely probably will get Democrats to be advocating to the electorate to vote for it. Mm-hmm. And if if it's a ballot initiative uh, that's proposed and we oppose it, but it still passes, uh, you're likely to see Democrats t- to advocate to the people that they should not vote for it. And, to, and then, and then, if that is the case, well, will the concern then be, well, they tried, and we, we, as the electorate, we, we said no, and that's it, or do you think there'll <laughs> be an appetite, especially from your caucus, to take it up again, and 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 again, this is all hypothetical, but yeah. to take it up again, and 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 try to get it to where you think it should be, we we want to do whatever we believe would be the best opportunity for Mississippians to have a voice at the ballot box when when the Mississippi legislature has failed to speak to it. And so um, we would want to just to put a ballot initiative back in place, but it's not attainable or it's not right. not able to be achieved by the people, you know? Are there any are there any new restrictions that you, I mean, you mentioned the putting in an amendment about the flag, <laughs> but um, but are you open to any, any kind of added restrictions? Uh, for one, uh, I think one thing that had been kind of, Brought up and, and at least you know, uh, at least was entertained uh, was the idea of not allowing legislative uh, the legislature to create like alternatives as they did with medical marijuana and as they did with I think it was initiative forty two with the MAP. Um, is that something um, that a restriction? It's not clean. It is a restriction, but is that a is that a restriction your caucus can get behind? Well, I mean, the the the, the current the the law allows. You know, a legis- the legislature to come up with an alternative. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do recognize and I do believe that the reason why Initiative 42, the initiative to fully fund our schools, failed was because um, the alternative was very confusing and the voters just didn't know how to vote when you had two um, items on the ballot to vote for, 42 mm-hmm. and 42A. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the voters got smarter when we actually took up uh, Initiative 65 for medical marijuana. Mm-hmm. And uh, the advocacy was actually uh, making sure that voters understood what to vote for and what not to vote for. And I believe that uh, if we had a a good ballot initiative, uh, even with the alternative, now voters know what to expect uh, when they see uh, – uh, the alternative, as opposed to the initial uh, uh, ballot initiative, okay. that, that they, initiative that they put on the ballot. So that restriction, I, I don't, I don't know. Well, we, okay. we can discuss it, but uh, I, I don't think it'll make or break us. Okay. Because I think that if we could have a ballot initiative that just speaks to uh, reflecting the four congressional districts and no other restrictions, then you wouldn't see even me uh, making. Uh, amendments to, to to put other restrictions on the ballot. Okay. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll shift here. Um, uh, a bill has been filed in your chamber um, to uh, to close three Mississippi universities. That doesn't explicitly name you know which ones, but um, but as a result of kind of this this we've heard from 
um, in, 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 in legislative hearings, uh, the, the, we've seen the numbers of this, this, what they call enrollment cliff. Enrollment's kind of dropping, especially, is especially hurting the regional um, state universities. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like we've talked, you characterize yourself as a, as a, as a Delta senator. Um, and so uh, Delta State University, Mississippi Valley State University, uh, two, you know, regional um, state universities that have seen some declining enrollment. I mean, I think almost all of them, except to, with the exception of the two, uh, 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 the University of Mississippi and Mississippi State, have seen uh, trends in enrollment going down. Uh, what, I mean, how, what's your stance on on closing in any universities? Um, and what do you think, you know, legislation like this, whether or not it's it passes in committee, whether or not it's even taken up for a voting committee, but what does introduction of legislation like this say to you, at least, about the, um, the attitudes towards uh, regional institutions of higher learning? I, I think regional institutions of higher learning, they have their purpose and they are needed. Uh, if you live in the Mississippi Delta uh, and you, you work in the Mississippi Delta, and you can go to select Delta State University or Mississippi Valley State University. Uh, it, it just meant so much or it means so much to the people that live there and to their families to be educated in the region that they grew up and the region that had given so much to them, right? And to take away um, institutions of higher learning, no matter where they are, I just think it's bad business, it's bad policy in the state of Mississippi. We should be figuring out ways uh, to respond to whatever the cha- the current challenge is and come up with uh, a solution to overcome that particular challenge or that obstacle. We should be finding ways to fully fund our schools at every level of government, might, whether it's K-12, whether it's community colleges, whether it's uh, institutional higher learning. Uh, find ways to, to reward and retain our faculty members and our staff at, at these institutions, not proposing legislation to close them. Uh, do you think the push towards workforce development, while while in, in some in some degree, I think anyone can argue is, is a necessary and, and, and noble cause, but do you think that the, this this recent push towards that is at the is to the detriment of the state's uh, you know four year in, uh, institutions? I, I I really look at it as just another tool in the toolbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, everyone does not want to attend a four year um, college or institution. Right. You know, some want to go to community college, some want to do workforce. And, and I support that. You know, when you're from, from the Delta or anywhere else in rural Mississippi, uh, you may not want to go to Ole Miss or USM or Jackson mm-hmm. State. But that's okay. That's okay. I just think those opportunities should exist and we should create as many opportunities for Mississippians to have success in the state of Mississippi and do everything we can so we don't still experience one of the biggest challenges that we are experiencing, which is the brain drain. Right. People are leaving the state of Mississippi and we lost population based upon the last uh, census. And so we need to try to do everything we can to create those opportunities. And when you talk about uh, closing universities, uh, you create an opportunity. I mean, you actually taking away those opportunities for people. I um, I asked uh, the minority leader of the House the same question. I'm going to ask you. Um, there are clearly, you know, policy priority differences between your caucus and and uh, the Republican caucus. But going into this session, uh, aside from aside from Medicaid expansion, because we we've, we've discussed that one, um, what other what other you know policy priorities are there that would you you see a lot of bipartisan support? Bipartisan support. Um... Certainly, I would say there's bipartisan support about uh, expanding infrastructure. Um, um, the largest infusion of federal dollars that we've seen in the state of Mississippi was the bipartisan Biden-Harris infrastructure deal. Mm-hmm. And um, and I certainly want to take this opportunity to thank uh, U.S. Senator Roger Wicker and Congressman Thompson for supporting the measure. Uh, we may not have gotten the support from our other uh, federal congressional leaders, uh, but they took the credit once the money got here, right? But I do believe, and I want to take this opportunity to say this, that legislative Democrats believe before, even before we got the federal dollars, that we should have our own state comprehensive infrastructure plan. 
because we need to invest in our own infrastructure. And we should do that uh, from High Street uh, at the state capitol. Uh, and the, the, the question is going to be, Mike, what is the real outlook of the state of Mississippi once all those federal dollars go away? And so um, I do believe that we would have bipartisan support as it relates to broadband and what we do as it relates to broadband. Now, the devil is in the details uh, because we want to make sure that those broadband dollars go as, as, as it as it relates to legislative Democrats, mm-hmm. we want to make sure that those broadband dollars go to the areas that need it most. Well, sure. So then with that in mind, what's your assessment of Beam so far? I mean, former Senator Sally Doty, one of your former colleagues, is heading up Beam. So what, what's your assessment? Um, Sally is a great person. I support Sally, and uh, I, I look forward to her leadership as it relates to Beam. Um I've been present when she has done presentations. Uh, I, I will say I am concerned about some of the maps that I've seen. Uh, the, the maps clearly show areas that are desperately in need of broadband. I'm j- I just would like to see those areas get the broadband first. Okay. Uh, and, and the same way how, I've, how legislative Democrats and how I personally felt about infrastructure. I think anytime we get infrastructure dollars uh, in the state of Mississippi or when we are passing or considering policy as it relates to that, we should start with those areas uh, that have been neglected the most or who need the dollars the most and work our way uh, down down that list. And the same thing I believe with broadband. I think we will be better as a state if we can start in those areas that are most in need and work our way to areas that are least in need as it relates to broadband. Okay. And what about as far as infrastructure as in, um, as it relates to, you know, forms of alternative energy, roads, bridges? Um, you know, are, are those are, are y'all you seeing eye to eye um, with your with with leadership across the aisle in, in those regards? I'm very optimistic. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we can leave it there then. Um, <laughs> Senate Minority, Senate Minority Leader Derek Simmons, thank you so much for spending some time and speaking with us today, uh, this week uh, on that issue. Mike, it's always great to be at MPB. Right. 